I'm Jen Andre. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Command, which is a startup based out of Cambridge here in Boston. Uh, my background is, I would say it's in R&D and in security products. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur, so before Command, I was co-founder of a company called ThreatStack, which does cloud-based security monitoring, which is also based out of here in Boston. Um, before that, I worked R&D at Mandiant, um, and before that, I did several roles at Symantec, at Symantec's MSSP. I started off working the SOC, and then I moved more to like the product engineering side. So I have, for better or worse, a background in security and security products. <laughs> Um, some of the other stuff I do is I help organize a local Boston security meetup group here called HackSecure. Um, we're just getting started, but we're starting to hold monthly meetups. Uh, we do things like lightning talks, and so it's basically designed for practitioners to come and talk about what they're working on. So I'm really excited about some of the stuff we have coming up. We've organized the CTF over at Rapid7, um, and we should have some fun stuff happening there. Anyway. So I realized when I was writing this talk, not everyone knew what a Hydra was, so I figured I should put some slides here to explain it, and, and thank you for pointing that out. Um, so a Hydra, for those of you that don't know, is a mythical creature. It's definitely not real, but it's a creature, and the story of this creature is if you cut off one of its heads, two will grow back. So there's a whole, there's a whole mytho mythological story about it, um, but that's the essential core point of it. Um, and I wanted to talk about how we as security teams uh, should aspire to some of those traits. So uh, the first trait I want to talk about is resiliency. So um, I like this picture here because uh, I'm assuming all of you are familiar with the Pirate Bay um, and the many attempts to shut off uh, file sharing or torrent sharing there. But I think resiliency is one key point that we can, we can take from this mythological myth. If you cut off one of its heads, two grows back. And we as security teams should aspire to that sort of resiliency. Scalability is another thing. Obviously, having multiple heads is a useful thing. The guy in this picture here looks like he's kind of struggling to deal with what's going on here. And um, it can kind of feel like this as a defender. But if you're, if you're an attacker and you have to avoid all these different traps, um, you can kind of turn the tables on an attacker as well. And I'm going to talk about some of those uh, use cases later on. So the key point about this is that we want these traits across not just like the systems that we're trying to secure and the stuff we're trying to secure, but also in our security team as well. We should be resilient and we should be scalable. So as the organization grows that we are protecting, um, we should also scale to that organization. We should be resilient to changes uh, within the environment we're protecting. And for most of us, we have to be just because uh, we don't take a snapshot of a company or a network at a certain state and protect that. Uh, we have to always be thinking about the, the next big thing. So ways we fail at both of those things. Um, we own the policy and the process around things, but don't help execute. And I'll talk uh, about more specific use cases, but it's generally the philosophy that um, we give out these policies or define these processes to these other organizations, um, sub-organizations and teams that we're working with. And we say, you need to be doing this versus you need to be doing this, and here's a way we can help you get that done. Um, I think another way where security teams can fail is we don't scale ourselves. So if we are the gating factor for security decisions, um, if we put a process in place or a policy in place that says, you know, we need to have some sort of, uh, you know, vulnerability management process, but you guys are, you know, we need to approve everything or... Um, and for any login that comes in or any access control, we have to approve the access control. Uh, we become the gating factor and it's hard to scale ourselves. And also, if we hold all of the knowledge and expertise about security, and every time a decision has to be made, they have to come to us, then I think we also fail. So this concept of the human botnet, um, how many of you have been or seen a security at scale conference held by Facebook? Cool. Yeah, there's one in Boston recently, and I like these conferences because um, you just tend to see some interesting ways um, these new technology companies are solving problems in security. Um, so this term actually came from Diogo Monica, who I think he's at Docker Security now, but back when he gave this talk, he was uh, at Square Security. And this is actually a really good talk to watch. 
because he talks about some of the stuff they did at Square, um, which is obviously a payment processing company, um, uh, you know, a, t a technology company that uh, he had to do in order to protect um, that business. And he didn't have a huge security team. He didn't have a huge security budget. So he ended up having to do some really innovative things. And one concept he introduces in this talk is the idea of being <laughs> a human botnet. So rather than um, you know, security taking all of the tasks that security traditionally owns, he decided to introduce some processes and some tools to start scaling that out to the rest of the organization. And that's actually kind of the core of this talk. There's gonna be some you know, talk of automation and, and different tools to accomplish that, but really the philosophy is like, how do we as security teams scale ourselves so uh, we can be resilient and um, we can be flexible? So the first use case I want to talk about is around security monitoring. <clears throat> so when you think about how security teams have traditionally done security monitoring, you have all these different tools and systems generating alarms. They're, they're looking at a bunch of different stuff. Um, the cool thing is, is like there's, there's actually more, uh, I think, data collection and more technology today. We have all these new different types of cool endpoints that do all the these interesting um, collection and, and alerting of things, uh, and it's really great. Except that you need someone to actually monitor these alerts. You're gonna you're gonna do some level of filtering things out, but um, you know, this is how I felt. Like this is what, part of why I left the sock, because after you know six months of doing that work, I was like, I don't want to do event triage ever again in my life. I want to work on the systems that actually detect these threats and try to improve that. So what if I told you that you didn't have to, to do this anymore? Like this, this wasn't the only way to do security monitoring. So I don't know how many of you saw, um, I guess three or four weeks ago, uh, Brian Huber, who's a security engineer at Slack, posted this blog post. And I thought it was really interesting, um, and it very much ties into this whole talk I'm giving. But it, it's all around how they, the team at Slack, scaled out their security monitoring. They don't have a huge, you know, sock with a, a bunch of security in us triaging all these alerts. What they did was very interesting. So, oh, my, I failed on animation, but you get the point. So, the way their process works is they have monitoring on um, various servers and endpoints. They do security monitoring, right? And um, what happens is that every time there's an alert that happens, uh, the alert doesn't immediately go to some uh, security event manager event queue for a security analyst to triage. What they do instead uh, for certain classes of alerts is they actually determine who could potentially triage that alert. So in this particular use case, if someone logs into a, a server, right, like an application server, and runs a command that Slack deems suspicious, um, what they do is they look up, well, who, who's the user that's actually logged in at the time? Um, what, what's a Slack username? And then they triage via Slack. So what they'll do is they'll send a direct message to that person and say, hey, did you actually run this command that we had thought was suspicious? That person can reply yes or no. They can acknowledge it or not. And then the acknowledgement itself is actually um, confirmed via a two-factor system. They have a kind of an app on their phone where someone has to confirm that they actually acknowledge alert. And that's cool. And the cool thing about it is like, it's not really that hard to implement when you think about it. So what are the, some of the pieces that you need to actually accomplish this? You need the endpoint monitoring. The cool thing is, is there's a lot of open source tools that actually accomplish this stuff. And by the way, like in their particular use case, they were doing some, some very specific behavioral monitoring. This could also apply to application monitoring as well. There's no reason why you couldn't scale those alerts or even certain classes of network alerts to um, you know, more sophisticated members of your operations and engineering teams. Um, you need a means of determining user identity and ownership. So again, like if you're using open source stuff, you can use a configuration management database. Um, if you have some other internal system, you need that as well. You can use that as well. Um, you know, you need to determine who, you need the first factor notification capability. So in this particular example, they're using Slack. But you could easily use HipChat, Jabber, IRC, anything else to first get in touch with the user and try to confirm whether or not um, that security alarm was something that uh, needs to be investigated. 
and then you need the two-factor confirmation. So in the example they used, um, I think they had built an app. If you actually go and look at that blog, it's like a custom app that they had built that does a push notification. But again, like you, you could use Twilio or something else, some other, maybe even email as another two-factor authentication mechanism. Um, yeah, so I just talked about that. And then, then this is sometimes the toughest part. You need the technology to glue it all together. Um, to be honest, like this isn't actually that much code to put together. And in order to prove that to you, I'm going to show you a demo. So pray to the demo gods. This works. Um, actually, first, before I do the demo, let me talk about um, the, the architecture that I came up with to replicate this. Um, so you see here, like I have this example server that I'm going to set up using a Vagrant virtual machine. I've installed sys.digfiles code because it's open source and it's free. Um, you can tell I just, like, it didn't take me weeks to write this because this was released this week. <laughs> I literally just launched it. Um, but, like, if you want a more commercial solution, like, actually the last company I co-founded, ThreatStack, has a very nice turnkey solution. And, um, you know, for Windows support, there's other commercial solutions that you can use. Um, again, like, it's not the, the actual note of the monitoring system isn't that important. It's more about demonstrating the process here. And then I have a little agent that I wrote that basically looks for the alerts on that box. And then what it'll do is every time there's an alert, it will forward it to um, our, our deputy bot server. And what does that server do? It actually connects to Slack and it will do, well, before it even does that, it does certain things. Like it looks up who does the user account belong to. Um, so if it's Jay Andre who's logged in, it's gonna be me. And it's gonna look up my phone number and then it will try to notify me on Slack. I have to confirm that that behavior was me. And if I confirm it, it's gonna to try to two-factor message me on Twilio. So let's see if I can actually get this demo to work. <laughs> so some of the tools I'm using here, just to go over it. Um, again, these are all free or open source or like open platforms. There's nothing here that's, you know, like customer at all. Uh, this tool here is just a tool that I had to use to uh, mirror my messages. It's super sketchy, so after this talk, I'm probably going to delete it because <laughs> it's like connected to my Android phone in all these weird ways. Uh, let's see if I can make sure I'm logged in here. Cool. Those are all my text messages. If anyone here has my phone number, please don't text me because it will show up here in the notifications. <laughs> I'm looking over you, commanders. <laughs> um, oh, and before I get started, I'm going to show a little bit of some of the other stuff here. Um, this is actually the repo with the source code. Again, this is very much proof of concept. Don't deploy this in a production envi environment. It's going to require a lot more validation to actually use. Um, just to, to show a little bit about what I'm actually going to alert on, um, I've deployed the Cystic Falco tool with two rules. One rule, which is to detect what I call privilege escalation. And all this does, actually, let me just zoom in here so you can see this. Is that good? So the privilege escalation rule will just look for people basically running um, sudo. So if you look at, uh, let's do here, user, whoops. Yeah, the user exec binders here corresponds to a sudo execution, if I can find it. Yep, exactly. So it's looking for anyone running sudo or su on this particular machine. And um, if it's not the agent itself, because I don't want to report on my own alerts, I'll create this endless loop of stuff that's really annoying to deal with. Probably more annoying for Twilio and Slack than me, but annoying. And then I want to look for anything. Um, this is here is just the system call exec CDE, which is a process starting up. Very simple. Um, all right, let's go down here. I can't actually zoom in here for some reason, but if you can see this here, the second alert I have is on network activity. And again, um, this is, I think actually just shipped with Falco. I modified it just a tiny bit to filter anything from the agent itself because of that infinite loop issue. And all I'm looking for is any inbound or outbound network activity from the IP family that's not the agent and um, actually has a process name because sometimes, um, for some reason, some events come in without a process name. That's it. So this is the Sysdig tool if you're interested in it. 
Um, again, I will look at, uh, if you're looking at other tools, there's other open sources, OS Query, Threats Act's a very good turnkey commercial one. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. So for the second factor notification, I am using Twilio. Twilio is just uh, basically an API for sending text messages and creating voice messages. Um, they have like a nice little REST API and it's very easy to use. So I used it because I had to do this demo very fast. <laughs> um, what I've created here is a Slack, a Slack group. I called it Security Bot Demo. Um, and once I start the service, you'll see basically a bot come up called Deputy. Um, you'll see here I also created a channel called Security. So what happens if I don't actually confirm the second factor authentication or I say this whole, you know, this thing happened but it wasn't me, is that the uh, security alert will get escalated by getting posted to the security channel so the security team can deal with it. Now again, you'd probably want a more robust process for actually escalating uh, security events. <laughs> All right, so now that that's done, let's get started with the demo. Again, try not to message me, or at least keep it PG if you do. So um, the first thing I'm gonna do is actually log into my Vagrant server, created a user J Andre to do so. Hopefully this will work. Ta-da. Um, oh, so this tool here is just, uh, I'm just running basically uh, a proxy so that um, my agent can connect and post messages to um, an HBS IP. Like, I just wanted to make it more consistent for my demo environment. That's not required in a production architecture. And here is my security bot, and I'm using Docker basically to start it up. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm going to start up my security bot. And what it's going to do, it's going to create an HTTP server. It's going to listen for two posts. So um, alerts is where my agent's going to be posting alerts to when it sees them. And confirm is where the Twilio callback API is going to post the confirmation after I've replied via text message. Any questions so far? Now pray to the demo gods this works. So. First of all, I'm going to pretend I just logged in this box. You know, I'm a system admin. I'm going to do something um, that's going to be triggered by our security monitoring system. And because I have one of those privilege escalation alerts configured, it should this should work. Actually, let me just um... ah. So you can see here that I got a message saying a suspicious command was ran. So again, what happened here was the agent. Um, which is constantly looking for message from Cystic Falco, um, got an alert and posted a message to um, my Slack channel saying, hey, uh, you logged in and you ran sudo ls on this particular box. Now, my job here, if this is, you know, this is me, I'm just going to confirm, yes, I ran that. And then it says acknowledging. And what it's going to do is confirm via my phone. And because I don't pay for Twilio, I'm using the demo or the trial account. It can be a little bit slow, but hopefully a message will come through actually confirming in a second. And if not, you can see previous examples of me testing this service out. Come on, Twilio. Oh, yeah, so it came in on my phone and then I refreshed right when it was coming in so you didn't see the notification. Um, but you do see the message, um, sudo ls was ran on this box at this time. Now I can confirm um, that I actually ran it. But like, just for the sake of this demo, I wanna pretend that like, hey, like someone had actually stolen my Slack credentials and um, tried to basically confirm the security alert happened for me. So I'm just gonna hit no to reject And then what you see is the escalation process happening where, whoops, where we see it actually in the security channel now. Again, like this probably isn't the most robust, robust escalation process. You're probably gonna want this to go into an actual ticketing system or event queue uh, for an incident handler to handle. But you can see um, the benefits of this is like, I don't have to deal with every single potential security alert that comes in. 
I can actually fan out or crowdsource some of these security alerts to um, more sophisticated members of the engineering team and ops team and reduce the burden of alert triage on the security team. Any questions? Uh, thumbs up. <laughs> Yeah, again, all the source code is um, up on GitHub. It's very much proof of concept. Like some of the things like the actual looking up my phone number is just hard coded to environment variables. You don't want to use this. You want an actual system where you're looking up people's um, uh, credentials and everything like that. So cool. Now back to this talk. Present. So that's just one example of how um, through a combination of both technology, process, and I think security culture, we'll talk, talk about a little bit later on, we can actually start crowdsourcing some of the tasks that were previously owned by security to um, you know, other members of the organization. Second use case, and this actually comes from um, the talk that I referenced in the first part of the slide, um, the human botnet, is around authentication and access control. So we have this problem, like everyone, you know, every company tries to have some sort of single sign-on solution, but it turns out like that rarely ever works, especially now that we have all these different SaaS services that, you know, teams like to sign up for and use. And that makes it a big pain in the ass for the security team when someone leaves the company um, or even switches teams, like who actually has access to what? Um, and if you see this, this image on the right is actually from a friend of mine. This was uh, a list of his credentials that he had to ha have um, at his company. And I will say it was a security company. <laughs> so even though, yeah, even though you can see we had several single sign-on solutions, like the thing I like here is like some other password that is SSO but not. <laughs> you have all these different passwords for things. And like someone, um, when someone leaves the company, whoops. The usual process is you get you get this checklist, right? And someone goes through and disables all this access, which is not super scalable. And if the security team is the gating factor at all that, that's time taken away from you guys to do other things that you probably should be doing. So let me see if I can get this to work again. Cool. So that's absolutely the wrong solution. Um, security should not gate. Uh, access control for things, although that is a solution I've seen some teams actually try because I want to be able to, um, when a compliance auditor comes in and say, yeah, here's who has access to what, you know, when someone leaves the company, we have a process and this actually gets implemented. And also, like, they don't want to have credentials lying around in case they get stolen. So the next case study I want to talk about is, again, from that talk, it's from Square. And I thought this is a really cool solution. Um, so what Square did is they built this portal called Doorman. And what Doorman is, is an app store of uh, access control. <laughs> so they have all the different things that people would need access to. And what they do is if you want access to like Amazon, you go in and you request access to Amazon. And instead of the notification going to security who has to approve it, it actually goes to the person's manager. Because um, what they figured was like your manager was the best person the person who is best equipped to actually answer should this person have access to it or not. That said, that brings up a couple of questions. What happens if your manager just approves everything? Like he doesn't want to deal with it. He's like, yes, yes, yes. You know, Bob, uh, who's basically an administrative assistant, has to have access to everything. Um, and what happens if people just abuse the system and you know get access to all the things they don't need? What happens when people leave? So one cool thing they actually built into this system was uh, basically access expiration, like automatic access expiration. So if you, they create an account for you on like an application server or somewhere else and you never use it, um, what happens to that account? Uh, it will actually get deleted over time. So things age out. So even if um, you know, someone leaves the company and they go through that checklist, um, I'm assuming the system actually automates the, the deep provisioning, but let's say you still have a checklist and someone forgot to remove you from an account, eventually you would still lose access because um, you're no longer logged in. You can't get into the VPN, you can't log into that one particular server. So I thought that was a cool concept. And again, by using, by crowdsourcing the work to um, the managers instead of making the security team the gating factor, um, they, they actually are crowdsourcing the work they have to do. 
So again, this is all cool stuff, but there are some actual challenges to implementing this. Like, you know, not every organization can do this. And I wanted to point some of that out. So it's gonna be challenging to implement if you have a highly siloed culture where people, you know, are responsible for their thing. They don't wanna take any security tasks because, you know, they're gonna say that's security's job. Um, you need to have a very collaborative culture uh, where you are all trying to solve problems together to be able to accomplish this, I think. If you're outsourcing your IT and operations, it's also gonna be very hard because, um, again, like if there's a contract in place and <laughs> you're paying this person to do this, um, it's gonna be very hard for them to do additional work outside of the scope of that contract. Um, if you don't have development skills in your security team, this is also gonna be challenging because, again, a lot of the system relies on some level of automation, being able to figure this stuff out. Um, and scripting it, and to be honest, that's a hard thing to hire for these days. Everyone wants to have a dev on their security team, but not everyone can. And the, again, the final challenge is you don't have the technology in place to do the things you want to accomplish, like security monitoring, um, there's no API access to the uh, things you want to instrument. That stuff's, that stuff's challenging, you can't really get around that very easily. That said, there are some organizations where it can be successful. I think if you have a strong operation, engineering, shared culture, if you're doing DevOps, or where people are starting to, you were, they take responsibility for these things and there's a high level of communication, you can, you can probably introduce this concept and succeed. Again, same sort of thing, good cross-functional relationships. You have a CISO or some sort of security leadership that you know crosses boundaries and it can be a champion for you, et cetera. And your security team already has some dev capabilities, or the business is willing to dedicate, you know, some programmers to a project like this, um, in the name of, you know, uh, security. In conclusion, um, security should not be monkeys. Uh, in my opinion, we should be the experts, uh, and we should think of creative ways to reduce, you know, alert fatigue for the security by crowdsourcing these tasks. Uh, where possible, um, instead of just providing a policy or a guideline, we should provide some level of automation um, to actually make it easier for the business to adopt um, our security policies. And, whoops, we should bring on experts when experts are needed. Um, and that's what I, I really think, you know, in the future the security team is going to be. We're going to be the experts, we're going to be the, the, the knowledge, but our, our job is also to educate um, the rest of the organization and you know deputize them on specific security tasks wherever we can and we should not be the sole owner of security and the benefits of this is that you know bring it back to the hydra thing it's hard to kill uh you know if the whole security team uh goes on vacation or it gets food poisoning security monitoring and these tasks should not stop and that's what we want to accomplish here thank you any questions So there is a fair amount of chat ops stuff in there. Yes. Um, are there other like chat ops applications that you think are more relevant to security than just kind of general? Like the security monitoring use case? Yeah, yeah. like you could definitely, um, I saw someone who did a follow up post where I think they integrated it with um, like Signal Sciences WAF. So you could actually, I think run scans or like do WAF logs or do something. But again, like, oh, I've also seen someone else where someone else like you could send a command to the bot and have it run an MAP scan, or you know, you could have it go fetch logs. So based off of a like a security alert that comes in, maybe I need more information to determine, hey, that was me or not. Maybe I was drinking or something, um, and I needed the other <laughs> logs just for context. So maybe you could have it. Um, you could send a command to the bot and have it fetch other logs around the same time. So um, you can actually use the bot for more than just like the initial notification. You can actually use it as part of the um, incident handling and investigation, and even potentially part of the response process. I think I'm early. Yep. <laughs> Thank you.